Welcome one and all to another episode of Space This Week, the Monday show where we recap all the latest and greatest news regarding rocket launches, starship development and spaceflight events, as well as get you ready for all the upcoming launches and major events this week. So let's get right to our first segment, all the biggest developments with SpaceX's Starship. Of course, before we do that, make sure you're subscribed so that YouTube notifies you of these videos on time so that what we're going to cover today isn't out of date or anything like that. That. Anyway, I am sure it doesn't need stating what the biggest news of last week was regarding Starship, the high altitude flight test of Starship serial number 11. This was the fourth high altitude flight of a Starship vehicle, following in the footsteps of SN8, 9 and 10. None of its predecessors successfully nailed the landing, so when we all tuned in to SpaceX's livestream on the 30th of March, hopes were high for a fully successful run. Not that we could see anything, sadly. The flight was delayed due to the FAA inspector not being able to make it to the originally planned launch time, and by the time rescheduling had taken place, the fog had rolled in on Boca Chica, and we couldn't see much of anything. Nevertheless, the launch proceeded well, with the vehicle effortlessly pulling off the ascent, transition to belly flop at Apogee, and descent back down to the landing zone. However, just after the landing burn began, SN11 lost telemetry at T plus 5 minutes 49 and the SpaceX livestream cut out. A loud boom was heard by spectators and a shower of debris was seen raining down upon Starbase. Yes, sadly, SN11 didn't make it as far as its predecessors as it disintegrated upon Raptor reignition. The cause of the failure is currently unknown. Initially, we thought it was the flight termination system, i.e. the self-destruct system that obliterated the vehicle after detecting an anomaly, but with still no word from SpaceX about what exactly happened, this is not really looking like the cause anymore. Elon Musk did optimistically report on Twitter that the explosion's crater was at least on target, and noted that Raptor Engine 2 had issues during ascent and didn't reach operating chamber pressure during the landing burn, though it doesn't seem likely that this would have caused the explosion. So far, the only attribution we have is something significant that happened shortly after engine ignition. SpaceX will almost certainly continue their investigation of the wreckage, though Elon later tweeted that the next inline prototype, serial number 15, will roll to the launch pad in a few days. Viewers of this show will have heard me talk about this prototype quite a bit before. SN8-11 to are all effectively the same vehicle, with only minor improvements with each version, but SN15 will be the first major leap forward, something echoed by Musk in his tweet stating that the prototype will feature hundreds of design improvements across structures, avionics and associated software, and the engines. If a definitive cause for the SN11's disintegration can't be found, the hope is that at least one of the improvements in SN15's design will cover the weak link that initiated the explosive chain of events from SN11's flight. I know it's disappointing to see another starship explode, not the least because we couldn't even see the fireworks this time, but don't forget that at this stage in the development, SpaceX weren't really expecting land success. SN8-11 to are very early stage prototypes that are more about testing the flight profile itself rather than the landing. It's just that they performed so much better than expected that the landing became the focus. SpaceX would have considered SN8 merely reaching Apogee to be an achievement, so the fact it made it as far as nearly landing was a huge and unexpected accomplishment. The unexpected success of SN8's flight was a major contributing reason for SpaceX to scrap SN12, 13 and 14 and move straight to SN15. Speaking of prototype scrapping, Elon confirmed that SpaceX have no plans on doing anything further with the massive BN1 prototype. This 70 meter tall Leviathan is the first prototype of Super Heavy, the gargantuan first stage of the complete Starship vehicle. We've known for a while that SpaceX had no plans on flying or static firing this thing, but there was some speculation that it might undergo pad rollout or cryo testing, but it looks like it's headed for the chopping block imminently, as Elon confirmed on Twitter that it's only a manufacturing prototype and nothing more, and will therefore be scrapped soon. 
Oh well, all the more reason to be excited about its successors, the BN2 and 3. The former is expected to perform a hop test similar to Starship's SN5 and 6, and BN3 is expected to be the first booster to fly with a Starship on top, most likely SN20, to carry the vehicle all the way up to low Earth orbit, beginning SpaceX's orbital testing campaign of the Starship. This should take place later this year, which is a truly remarkable pace for rocket development and is a another reminder that right in this moment we are living in the pages of the history books. The other vehicle that looks like it's facing the scrap heap, if it hasn't already, is Prototype SN 7.2. This is a Pathfinder tank designed to test a thinner type of stainless steel, 3mm as opposed to 4mm, which would result in a huge mass saving if implemented across an entire Starship vehicle. However, it was rolled back to the production site on the 15th of March and we've heard nothing about its fate since. The tank passed its cryogenic proof test on the 26th of January, but on the 4th of February it developed a leak during a pressurised to failure test. It's unclear if this means that SpaceX have abandoned plans of switching to 3mm steel, but with no further news regarding SN7.2, things aren't really looking very optimistic. I'll wrap up the Starship segment with Brendan Lewis's latest overview diagram of where we stand with the Starship vehicles, SN15 being fully stacked in the high bay and awaiting rollouts to the launch site, SN16, 17 and 18 have had several components prepared, and SN19 and SN20 have had some parts spotted, the methane header tank and thrust puck for SN19, and the leg skirt for SN20. And with all that Starship news out of the way, let's take a look at how the rest of the industry was doing last week. Week. On the 30th of March, SpaceX unveiled their glass dome concept for their Crew Dragon vehicle, which will offer 360 degree views of space. The dome is situated where the docking adapter for space station berthing would normally be situated, but this particular variant of the Crew Dragon capsule won't be heading for the International Space Station and instead will carry four civilian astronauts to space on a tourism mission, negating the need for a docking port. The glass dome will certainly be a welcome addition for the tourists, I'm sure. The closest comparison to this is the Coppola module on the International Space Station, though SpaceX's dome differs in that it appears to be a single uninterrupted piece of glass, rather than segmented like the space stations, giving a much cleaner view to the lucky passengers. We saw the unveiling of another spacecraft on the 30th of March. This was Virgin Galactic's VSS Imagine, which is the first of Virgin's next-gen Spaceship 3 class of vehicles. While it appears similar in appearance to the current VSS Unity, Virgin Galactic have stated that the VSS Imagine will be much easier to manufacture and service, and will have a shorter turnaround between flights. Virgin Galactic described it as being a modular design, with each major component, such as the cabin, fuselage and tail booms, being being built separately and then stuck together, which certainly gives me very Kerbal vibes. Hopefully it flies a bit better than most Kerbal aircraft, of course. <laughs> Last week we also got the first pictures of the Ingenuity helicopter fully separated from the Perseverance rover, sitting independently on the surface of Mars. The helicopter has been slowly unfolding and deploying itself over the past few days, and it's very exciting to finally see it stand proud on the Martian surface. NASA will want to undergo more diagnostics and pre-flight testing before we see it take to the skies, but this is a good sign that things are proceeding smoothly. One of my favourite things about the Ingenuity helicopter is that it's carrying a piece of aviation history. Underneath its solar panel is a stamp-sized piece of fabric cut from the wing covering of the Wright Brothers' aircraft that made the first ever powered controlled flight on Earth, so it's very fitting that it can be present for the first ever powered controlled flight on another planet. It's also fun to point out that the Ingenuity technically makes the Perseverance rover a US nuclear-powered aircraft carrier on the surface of Mars. Democracy is coming to an Olympus Mons near you, it seems. <laughs> we had an orbital rocket launch last week as well. This was in China and was a Long March 4C, which launched from the Chiaquan Launch Complex, successfully placing a GFN-12 observation satellite into low Earth orbit. That's all the news and launches that we saw last week. Which one makes you the most excited? For me, while the VSS Imagine is certainly an exciting one, the winner has to be the successful deployment of the Ingenuity. Let me know your thoughts down below, and hey, while you're at it, remember to like the video as well, as it helps support the content and keep us alive in the unforgiving tides of the YouTube algorithm. Anyway, last week is over, let's look ahead now to all the rocket launches expected to take place this week. <laughs> 
There are two orbital rocket launches planned for this week. The first will be on the 7th of April and will be the next Starlink mission from SpaceX, Starlink L23. As far as Starlink launches go, this one is pretty standard fare. This particular Falcon 9 first stage will fire its Merlin engines for its seventh flight overall and after second stage separation is expected to land around 610 kilometers downrange on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship. The second stage will then carry the 60 Starlink satellites to their low Earth orbit destination and after the fairings separate they're expected to splash down a little bit further downrange than the booster where they'll be fished from the water by SpaceX recovery vessel Sheila Bordelon which of course has taken over from Ms. Tree and Ms. Chief after SpaceX decided that catching fairings with a giant net while very cool, isn't really worth it. This will be the 10th flight for SpaceX in 2021, and here's hoping it goes well. The second orbital launch will be on the 9th of April, and will be a Soyuz 2.1 launching from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. This is an exciting one, as on board is no mere satellite, but Soyuz MS-18 with the crew of Expedition 64 to the International Space Station. This will be the 146th crewed flight of the Soyuz spacecraft, and will consist of two Russian cosmonauts, Oleg Novitki and Pyotr Dubrov and NASA astronaut Mark Van Hai. The spacecraft is scheduled to return to Earth on the 13th of October following 180 days in space and is expected to also serve as the return vehicle for Russian actress and film director Klim Shipenko who will launch to the International Space Station on the next crewed Soyuz mission, MS-19, to spend about one week on the station to film a movie. An interesting launch to conclude this segment with and given the vast history of the Soyuz launch vehicle an excellent stepping stone to our final segment all the best spaceflight anniversary set to take place this week the first anniversary of the week is tomorrow april the 6th when on this day in 1973 nasa launched the pioneer 11 spacecraft Pioneer 11 would serve as the backup for the Pioneer 10, and both were Pathfinder spacecraft designed to ensure that the upcoming Voyager 1 and 2 probes could safely pass through the asteroid belt and endure Jupiter's strong radiation environment. Pioneer 10 was launched first, and by the time Pioneer 11 was launched, its twin had already passed beyond the asteroid belt and was well on its way to Jupiter, which it would reach in December 1973. Mission planners made the decision to change the plan for Pioneer 11 and have it deviate from Pioneer 10's course, using the massive gravity well of Jupiter to perform a slingshot manoeuvre that would send it on a course for Saturn. Pioneer 11 completed its crossing of the asteroid belt in April 1974 and encountered Jupiter on the 2nd of December, taking the most detailed photographs of the Great Red Spot and mapping Jupiter's polar regions. It then began its cruise to Saturn and it began taking observations of the ringed planet in late July 1979. By this point, Voyager 1 and 2 had already launched and completed their flybys of Jupiter and were en route to Saturn as well. Mission planners therefore ensured that the Pioneer 11 passed through Saturn's outer rings, which would be the same path that Voyager 2 would take to ensure that the route would be safe for Voyager 2. Pioneer 11 ended up passing within 13,000 miles of Saturn's cloud tops, and during the encounter it sent back data on the planet, its rings, moons, and some 440 images. In doing so, Pioneer 11 became the first spacecraft to explore Saturn, and it completed its study of the ringed planet in October 1979. It then sailed on a trajectory that eventually left the solar system, and on the 23rd of February 1990, it crossed the orbit of the outermost planet and began its interstellar mission. The final signal from Pioneer 11 was received on the 24th of November 1995, when it was more than 4 billion miles from Earth. On the 8th of April 1964, the Gemini 1 was launched. The Gemini program was, of course, the precursor to the Apollo program and was designed to test and validate numerous operations that would be required for lunar surface return. Gemini 1, as the name would suggest, was the first Gemini mission and was an uncrewed test flight designed to test the structural integrity of the Gemini spacecraft and its Titan II launch vehicle. The mission also tested the new tracking and communication systems for the Gemini program, at the same time providing training for the ground support crews ahead of the 
first crewed flight. The launch went well, and the spacecraft entered low Earth orbit around five and a half minutes after launch. Its orbit ended up being about 20 kilometers higher than planned, which lengthened the spacecraft's lifespan from three and a half days to four, though the mission itself ended long before this point, as the onboard batteries were only designed to last for a single orbit. Gemini 1 and its attached second stage eventually re-entered the atmosphere over the South Atlantic, and the Titan II launch vehicle was subsequently deemed to be man-rated, as in safe for human flight, though the Gemini spacecraft itself wouldn't receive man-rated certification until the launch of Gemini 2. On the 10th of April 2019, scientists from the Event Horizon Telescope project announced the first ever image of a black hole. And here it is! Yes, it's a bit fuzzy and to the untrained eye, dare I say, a a little bit boring, but this is an amazing photograph. That's because the subject, the black hole at the centre of the Messier 87 galaxy, is about 55 million light years away from Earth. A bit too far for a single camera to zoom in on, the image was obtained using data from telescopes located all around the world to effectively create a virtual Earth-sized telescope which could provide the clarity needed to generate the image that you see before you. That's not all though, as in March of this year, a new photograph was revealed. This is the same black hole imaged in polarised light. The lines that swirl around the centre of the image mark the orientation of polarisation, which is directly related to the magnetic field around the shadow of a black hole, effectively giving us an image showing the signature of the magnetic fields around the black hole. This new photograph gives us crucial evidence to help understand how magnetic fields behave around black holes, and will remain one of the most important photographs ever taken, I'm sure. The final anniversary of the week will be on the 11th of April, when in 1970 NASA launched the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission. This was the third mission planned to land on the moon, and initially all proceeded as planned. The massive Saturn V rocket took off from Cape Canaveral, and after reaching orbit, the command module docked with the Aquarius lunar module. So far, so good. After successful docking, the spacecraft continued onwards towards the moon, but then, almost 56 hours into the flight, oxygen tank number two exploded, causing oxygen tank one to fail as well. Command module pilot John Swigard radioed the now in Infamous Houston, we have a problem here message. Hey, uh, we've had a problem here. And a problem they did indeed have. The oxygen supplied by the now failed tanks 1 and 2 was needed to supply the spacecraft with power and oxygen, and with the spacecraft getting further and further away from the Earth, the mission objective was changed from lunar landing to simply getting the crew back home alive. The lunar module had batteries and oxygen tanks for use on the lunar surface, and so the astronauts powered it up to use as a sort of lifeboat. Without it, the three astronauts would have certainly died. The first concern was to determine if there were enough resources to survive a loop around the moon and return home, given that the lunar module was only designed to support a 45-hour excursion, which would somehow need to be stretched to 90 hours. The other pressing concern was the increasing level of carbon dioxide being exhaled by the crew, which was absorbed by canisters of lithium hydroxide. The lunar module's canisters weren't big enough to support the three astronauts, and so ground control devised a way of connecting the lunar module's equipment to the command module's canisters using plastic, covers torn from manuals, duct tape, and other items. There was also the problem of how to get home. Obviously, the plan for lunar landing was out, and so instead, mission control instructed a short 35-second mid-course correction burn to optimise the lunar encounter to facilitate another burn two hours after the spacecraft's closest approach to the moon, a burn which lasted just over four minutes, after which the crew shut down most of the lunar module systems to conserve resources. The final major hurdle that would need to be overcome was preparing for re-entry. In order to survive re-entry, and ultimately perform the re-entry itself, the command module would need to be powered up, and the concern was that the condensation that had built up in the cold, powered-down spacecraft may have caused failure in the equipment. Luckily, the command module had extensive electrical insulations due to the improvements made in the wake of the Apollo 1 fire, and everything thankfully powered on normally. That just left the re-entry itself to overcome, which went well, and then the crew safely splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. A happy end to the mission then, and also an end to this week's rundown of all the best historic spaceflight anniversary set to take place this week. <laughs> And so concludes another episode of Space This Week. 
A real shame about the fate of SN11, not just because of the loss of the vehicle, but also the fact we couldn't even see the fireworks. I'm just happy that Star Hopper is still in one piece though, to continue overseeing the activity over at Starbase. Here's hoping SN15 is more successful, and you know what, I'm optimistic that this will be the one that nails it. It's the first Starship to see major overhaul to its design since the SN8, so I think that with the power of you liking and sharing this video, <laughs> it'll make it. Guess it's time for an end screen now, and we have a new layout. That's because I feel like I should give some more thanks to my patrons, who helped make this show possible, really. So there's a scrolling list of supporters on the left, and a link to my Patreon page itself is both on screen on the right, and also down in the description. The other things on screen are two videos, the top is a video chosen for you by YouTube, and the bottom is my most recent upload, whatever that may be. And I'll sign off with a huge thank you for watching.